Assistant Manager for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. We want to welcome everyone, including the OCM collaborative participants, to today's exciting e-course about how one cancer program met the practice requirements and quality measures of the oncology care model for implementing an emergency response system to triage their at-risk immunology IO patients. I am eager to introduce Dr. Sigrun Hallmeyer as our expert presenter, the 10th um, oncology e-course hosted by the Institute for Clinical Immunology, ICLEO. As you may know, ICLEO is an institute of ACCC and is the only initiative to prepare multidis multidisciplinary cancer care providers for the complex implementation of immunology in a community setting. The ICLEA program provides a host of educational resources and tools such as webinars, newsletters, e-learning module courses, tumor subcommittee updates, and immersed IO visiting expert program and live meetings. Now for today's e-course, I am pleased to introduce, introduce Dr. Hallmeyer, a medical director at Oncology Specialist Research Institute, Oncology Specialist SC. Dr. Hallmeyer is also a esteemed member of the ICLEO Advisory Committee. Dr. Hallmeyer joined oncology specialists in 2005 and provides novel and cutting edge therapies not available elsewhere in the framework of clinical trials, which present important and vital advances to the field of oncology and to many cancer patients. Dr. Hallmeyer attended medical school in Germany and completed her fellowship in hematology oncology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Hallmeyer has done research in breast and prostate cancer as well as melanoma. Her current research is focused on breast cancer and melanoma and functions as, as a principal investigator in several clinical trials. She has published work and has presented her results at institutional, um, international meetings. Now for a few housekeeping notes. Please feel free to submit questions to our presenter by typing questions in the box on your dashboard. I will post questions to Dr. Hallmeyer at the conclusion of her presentation. The webinar will be archived and available on the ICLEA website, ACCC-ICLEA.org. Now I'll send it over to Dr. Hallmeyer to kick off the webinar. Hi, good afternoon everybody or good morning depending on where you are residing in the United States. I, I'm just outside of Chicago and we have a beautiful winter wonderland that happened to us uh, over the last 24 hours here. So winter has certainly arrived in, uh, in northern uh, central uh, the United States. So I'm very happy to host this webinar here today. I was asked by the ACCC and ICLEO leadership to talk a little bit about our setup here that we have at our practice. Um, not really just to um, have a, a model to triage patients that have uh, emergent situations at home that are afflicted with uh, immuno-oncologic agents but other treatments as well, but I will have some examples at the end um, how this specifically works for our group uh, for patients receiving immuno-oncologic agents. So if we can move forward to the next slide. And that talks a little bit about the agenda here. So I'd like to introduce first our setting here a little bit so you have a bit of understanding of uh, what type of practice we have, what kind of setting we have with our associated hospital, and then describe sort of the typical emergency response to an oncology adverse event, including immune-related adverse events in our practice. Um, I'd like to introduce um, the oncology care model. I know that many of you who are on this call are probably pretty familiar with this, but maybe delve into this uh, a little bit more in detail as it relates to an emergency response to patients receiving treatment in our office. And then specifically talk about a pilot project that we have initiated here at Lutheran um, at our hospital system, um, which is called a symptom management area, and talk about the physician role, the nurse's role, as well as pathways that we have created for, for this particular area. And then um, spend the last part of this uh, quick webinar here to talk about the data analysis that we have to date and talk a bit about future direction as to where we think this might um, head for not just our institution but other institutions within our hospital network and potentially nationally. So if we can move forward. So we are associated with Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, which is a large nationally recognized academic research and teaching hospital in the northern suburban area of Chicago. It's actually the largest hospital system in Illinois and one of the nation's top 10 healthcare systems. It has the state's 
largest physician network of primary care physicians as well as specialists and subspecialists. So it's a pretty big hub to practice. Uh, we we at uh, Advocate Lutheran General Hospital are one of the key hospitals. There's another one in the south of the city called Christ Hospital, um, serving a very, very large um, community-based population. We can move to the next slide. And so within that hospital system, we are a private practice oncology group, currently a group of eight subspecialized hematologies and, and oncology physicians. Um, in addition to being very busy private practice oncologists, we also have multiple leadership positions within the hospitals, including the uh, director of the Cancer Institute, the chair of the Cancer Committee. Uh, we hold the vice president of the medical staff, the director of the fellowship program, division director, et cetera. So we are very, very involved, not just as practicing oncologists, but also in terms terms of um, leading the institution, in terms of developing future directions for the administration of oncology care for our patients here. We can move forward. And so how it is uh, probably quite typically um, in a private practice oncology setting and maybe not all that unique to us is an emergency response to our oncology adverse events, including these that are immune related adverse events. Um, this is sort of how we have it set up. So throughout our office, our coverage, which is typically from 8 in the morning until 5 p.m. each weekday, so Monday through Friday, um, we are proud to have what we call a primary nurse model. So we have nurses that are assigned to our our patients essentially for life. Probably the most significant role is for the patients that receive any type of uh, cytotoxic or cytoreductive therapy. Those patients receive a treatment nurse. Um, and so, you know, there's commonly also called chemo nurses, although much of the treatments that we do in our day and age is being replaced by agents that are anything but chemotherapy, you know, targeted agents and immuno-oncologic agents. And our nurses actually are um, spearheading um, many, many different nurse-driven programs as well. They have been recognized by the OCN and will actually have a big uh, presentation at this year's annual meeting where our immuno-oncologic specialized nurses are presenting um, a pathway for immune-related adverse events that we have modeled here in our practice as well. And then we have exam nurses. Those are the nurses that take calls from patients who are not assigned to a treatment nurse, so patients who don't have, for instance, a cancer diagnosis. So we have a very large anticoagulation uh, program. Um, the anticoagulation program itself has a specified, uh, specified uh, nurse system as well, and then we have a transplant program as well with specified nurses. And so all these uh, special nurses typically field most of the um, adverse event type of phone calls that come through the front desk um, as they filter down to the nurses, and they will uh, be able to manage man many of the questions um, and, and some of the problems directly, um, and uh, obviously can then get the um, uh, uh, appropriate attending physician involved if and, and when needed. Now, outside of office hours, we have a physician call system, again, probably not at all unusual for many private practices, Monday through Friday. All of us cover our own calls, and so if a patient of mine on a Tuesday at 9 p.m. has an issue, they have the option to reach me directly, and I will answer the call from home. And then on weekends, we cross-cover each other. We have a, um, a system where two of us are on call for each weekend. We have a short call person and a long call person, and uh, that particular system is in place from Friday at 5 p.m. all the way through Monday at uh, 7 a.m. in the morning, of course, and when there's a holiday, that, that, that particular day will be covered as well. And we have um, a very, very good, very efficient emergency department here at Lutheran General Hospital, which is a level one trauma center, very, very busy um, with high throughput uh, emergency center. Um, and so this is sort of our operational setup, and uh, we have applied for it and got granted access to participate in the oncology care model and have been participation, uh, participating since July of this year, um, as most practices that are um, in this particular uh, participation model. Now, by analyzing all sort of our resources that we have, um, we have identified deficiencies in coverage for cases which are based on treatment toxicity, so patient experiencing treatment-related nausea or diarrhea, fevers, those type of things. Those are not really true emergencies where normally a response would be, well, you need to call 911 or you need to go to the emergency room, specifically for the six symptoms that I have um, noted here, so nausea, dehydration, diarrhea, constipation, pain, fever with the possibility for neutropenia. Obviously, these are symptoms that many of our cancer patients experience, especially especially those that are in active therapy. And what we have noticed with the, with the setup that you see outlined here on the slide with our office hour coverage and our outside office hour coverage, 
most of those patients who will need to be assessed by a healthcare professional, unfortunately, were ultimately sent to the emergency room for assessment of dehydration or fever to rule out the possibility for neutropenia, uh, leading to a significant utilization of the emergency department, which was really not necessarily in the patient's and our best interest. So if we can move forward to the next slide, please. And so at the time when we analyzed sort of our setup, that is also where the oncology care model came our way and really made us critically analyze our practices op uh, operational um, uh, setup. And so as many of, many of you know, the oncology care model's goal is really to utilize appropriately aligned financial incentives to enable improved care coordination, appropriateness of care, and access to care for beneficiaries undergoing chemotherapy. So the very thing to look into how can we improve the care and lower costs through an episode-based payment model which would financially incentivize the practice to high quality and coordinated care rather than a fee-for-service system. This is a system that really looks at improvement projects that ultimately um, meet those end goals. It heightens the focus on furnishing services that specifically improve the patient experience or health outcomes and decreases costs and increase coordination and quality. So that is sort of the, the overlying umbrella of why oncology care model exists. Now there's a, a litany of different practice requirements. I only highlight two here that are specific um, and, and sort of relate to the project that we're talking about. So the OCM participants are expected to engage in practice transformation to improve the quality of care they deliver and provide patients with a model within the model with a 24/7 access to a clinician who has real-time access to patients' medical records, um, which we really had all along because all our physicians have home access to our electronic medical records. Um, but again, you know, having a service available 24-7 where patients are actually being seen um, outside of our office with that particular ac uh, access to the EMR is really another layer to this, um, to meeting this particular requirement. Um, obviously, it's recognized that cancer patients' complex medical needs don't arise just during normal business hours, and so it is really expected for an OCM participant uh, to be available to provide medical advice whenever the patient needs it. And so um, uh, diving deeper into how this particular OCM has been structured in terms of incentivizing the payments, there are specific quality measures and performance-based payments. And again, I highlight only two here. Uh, one of uh, the outcomes that be, is being measured is the number of ED visits per participating patient and the number of hospital admissions per participating patient. And so looking again at our setup and where we would potentially um, have room for improvement, that's sort of fits into the OCM development as well within our practice. Now, if we move forward to the next slide, please. And so, in addition to analyzing our own practice, participating in OCM, we have also uh, made available to the uh, cancer committee within our hospital uh, statistical assessments for what's called key result areas or KRAs uh, that are being pursued from a system perspective within our hospital system. And one of those, again, not unusual, many hospitals are doing that, is looking at 30-day and 7-day readmission rates. And I have blocked out here all the names on the left side of all the respective of attending physicians on our oncology unit, and you see the comparison on the top underneath the big 26.46 um, is 18.7, so that would be the national average that we should be thriving for, and as you can see, we are in the red um, by over um, extending um, our 30-day uh, readmission rate to 26.46% in the first half of 2016's calendar year. And so that is recognized also as a, as a deficiency uh, when, within our oncology um, endeavor, if you will, within the hospital system that needs to be addressed. Next slide, please. So when we started this initiative, we noted, noted that there was a trend, um, you know, as you can see, that the data is very, very volatile. It's essentially a little bit of all over the place, depending on what month you're looking at. But in general, the trend was upward trending, that the readmission rate to acute care within seven days was not something that we had good control over. We can move to the next slide. And so um, we uh, came up with the idea of creating a symptom management area to address the common symptoms that lead to unnecessary hospital admissions, which ultimately would also lead to improved patient experience. 
Um, that would also help us achieve one of the outcome goals within OCM, the extended hours with specific care for our patients by a specialized care team, knowing that we have a wonderful resource within our oncology inpatient unit where all our inpatient oncology nurses are OCM certified. Um, we would also be able to avoid ED visits, as you recall, that is one of the OCM um, outcomes that we are being judged for. And then the reduction in hospital admissions is one that is an OCM goal as well as one of our KRAs. So and, uh, creating a symptom management area, dealing with patients in an outpatient type of setting, avoiding ED visits, reducing hospital admissions, and taking care of patients with a specialized team hits multiple of the goals that we have achieved or have recognized as, as an achievable outcome for us. We can move forward to the next. And so uh, what we were uh, really very fortunate with is that our eight tower oncology unit had a very large storage room that was essentially sitting idle. And so we have identified that as a very good um, area for our symptom management area to be prepared for. And it only needed to be uh, painted, we needed to purchase three recliners, um, a nurse call system needed to be installed, the Dynamap needed to be purchased to be staying in the room, that's you know, the vital sign assessment uh, machine, and then a computer and phone jacks had already been installed into that room, so thankfully that was uh, an expense that we were able to spare. We can move forward to the next slide. And so here you see a couple of pictures. The one in the middle, the big hallway, is the actual eight tower oncology unit within our new tower building that was opened about seven years ago now. Um, and so the room, uh, the pictures on the left and right of this middle picture are the actual pictures of the symptom management area. You see that there's a private bay behind that um, glass um, area there. There are the, three, the, the recliners and the nurse would be sitting right here in the front of it at the chair having access on the computer to not only only the inpatient electronic medical record, but all the private office outpatient electronic medical records as well. Um, and the symptom management area is available essentially as soon as our office closes every single workday and opens on Friday um, and it's, uh, at, at 5 p.m. at uh, office closed and opens at, all the way until 7 a.m. on Monday morning when the office is open again. We can move forward to the next. And so how this works logistically is that the on-call physician, so again, throughout the week, there will be any of the physicians who is taking their own calls or the on-call physician on the weekend who takes a call for the entire group, directs the patient to the outpatient admitting registration desk, bypassing the ED. So if any of the six symptoms, the nausea, the dehydration, constipation, fever, pain, or diarrhea are called in, and the physician makes over the phone the judgment that this is probably somebody who could be managed in a symptom management area, um, they will direct the patient to the outpatient admitting registration desk rather than the emergency department. Once that uh, call has been finished, the physician then calls the admitting office, at which time a three-way three -way call is initiated between this admitting officer, the charge nurse up on the oncology unit, and the physician themselves. They discuss the patient, you know, of course, the logistics about who the patient is, date of birth, et cetera, so they are essentially pre-registered. And once the patient arrives at the admitting registration desk, the patient is then escorted to the three-chair outpatient space that you saw in the pictures on the oncology floor. Um, which is our converted storage room right at the beginning of the unit. They're initially registered as an outpatient on the floor, and the charge nurse either assumes care for this patient or assigns another nurse that is currently on the floor, you know, depending on um, what, what type of uh, workload they have for that particular hour or that particular day, which uh, for us really is a significant um, benefit because we had no incremental staffing cost at all. We are essentially utilizing the nurse that's already up on the Itawa Oncology Unit already assigned to a shift anyway. We also have the benefit of being a teaching institution, so we have resident physicians staffing our unit 24-7, and we also have hematology oncology fellow physicians. They are not in-house, though, 24-7, but when available, they are available to assess the patient upon request as well. Um, and again, these resident physicians and fellow physicians will have access to the outpatient chart for all affiliated private practice oncologist offices as well. Now, the way we have it set up is that there's a hard stop at four hours. So when the patient has been seen, you know, blood work has been drawn, uh, you know, testing has been performed as indicated, and if the patient has no um, improvement at the time, then they're converted to an observation status. And if within eight hours of their observation status there is no significant improvement, the patient is not able to go home, then they will actually be converted to a full admission. 
And we have uh, utilized six particular order sets, which I will introduce to you uh, just a bit down the road here on this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, one for nausea, one for dehydration, one for constipation, one for fever, and one for pain, and uh, the last one for diarrhea, and that I will discuss in a bit more detail. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, and so we are able to utilize our oncology certified nurse up on the oncology unit as an internal symptom manager. She provides the patient assessment and then initiates the appropriate pathway for the management of specific symptoms. So depending on what the patient had called in for and what was discussed with the patient's physician over the phone, that particular pathway will be initiated. And from then on forward, there are several interactions over the phone with the attending physician. An initial assessment is taking place. Patient is stable. You know, it's appropriate for the symptom management area. Occasionally, we have patients who come in and are actually a lot sicker than they appear to be over the phone and need to be converted immediately to admission. Um, so that this is essentially just an initial check on, yes, this particular process is appropriate. The second phone call then will happen about 30 to, uh, to 60 minutes later once there's a result review, so a CBC is back or a stool analysis is back, and then we discuss the intervention. And then uh, several, you know, two, three, five, whatever hours later, we have a dispositional review. Yes, the patient improved, patient is stable to go back home, or patient needs to be converted to observation or even inpatient admission. Now, we spent a lot of time on developing these particular pathways. We've actually created subcommittees um, within our 100 plus oncologist strong um, uh, hospital system here of 11 different hospitals. Um, and that also included pharmacists and nurse in, in take as well. So to be sure that we have really a multidisciplinary approach to the management of these common symptoms for our oncology patients. Move to the next slide, please. And so this is one of the guidelines. It's a very, very busy slide. So I have actually, uh, um, in the next two slides, three slides, uh, copied out some of the pertinent details. So this is the oncology symptom management guideline for the symptom of diarrhea. And so if we move, please, to the next slide. And it's divided into three different sections. The first section is the assessment. So this is, again, um, filled out by the nurse. It's an electronic document that is accessible by the nurse upon the verbal order by the physician over the phone once the patient presents for the initial symptom of diarrhea. And as you see here, there are certain things that need to be checked off, you know, the admission time, what the malignancy is, date of last treatment, what kind of treatment has been received, what type of antidiarrheal medications were received within the last 24 hours, is the patient febrile, you know, vital signs, the typical usual assessment that we would do for a patient that's being seen in, in, in any type of treatment area. And then we go to the next portion of this um, guideline. Next slide, please. That is the actual interventions. This is essentially an order set, and you can see all the different details here. You know, we'll test the, the stools for blood as well as WBC. Um, and then, uh, again, if necessary, the in-hospital physician can be um, accessible uh, as well for a brief physical examination and assessment. And then the BMP, of course, very important for uh, checking the hydration status to look at renal function, electrolytes, et cetera. And then antidiarrheal management already already put into this particular pathway here with Imodium, et cetera. And then other, you know, if other things are being um, ordered through the physician via their interaction. And then we're moving forward to the next slide. And that is essentially finishing off, if you will, a disposition plan here. Patient is so sick that he needs to be seen by uh, an attending physician in the emergency department. Thankfully, that hasn't happened yet, but it's certainly a theoretical possibility. Um, leads to hospital admission or transition to additional management guideline, which means that they will now become an observation patient, discharged to home, or if in, in, if they go home, we need to list any discharge uh, prescriptions and, and instructions that have been given in terms of follow-up and what to do from here on forward. So this is a, a very, um, you know, really symptom-driven and, and very exact uh, instruction for the nurse to care for a patient who presents with this particular symptom. If we move forward to the next slide, please. Now, this is the actual order set that exists within the hospital system in the electronic medical record. And you can see here many of the de details already, including starting IV fluids at 125 uh, cc's per hour. Again, test your stool. These are actual order instructions for the nurse to follow through for a, an admission diagnosis of diarrhea. If we can move forward to the next slide. 
And so we've uh, analyzed our data now since initiation of this symptom management area. We had a total of 20 patients that have come through um, on various days, most of them interestingly on weekends. Um, we are, seem to be fairly efficient in getting patients through the night and then having them see in, in our office for most of these symptoms to be managed here with the care of our outpatient nurses. But uh, the vast majority of patients who have been seen in the SMA within the hospital system were seen over the weekend. And you can see out of the 20, in the top box are the 20 patients that have been seen. 15 of those were actually discharged from the symptom management area um, and, and were discharged home, avoided a, an admission. Five of those patients un unfortunately did require admitting uh, to the inpatient service. Now the downside of this um, assessment has been what could have happened, if you will, in the same time frame. Um, we have analyzed the data that um, were seen in the emergency department in the same time frame. And as you can see here, there were a total of 338 patients who have been seen at our uh, emergency department for either one or more uh, of the six symptoms that we have pathways for in our symptom management area. Um, and from these particular diagnoses, 74% uh, of patients were able to be treated and released through the emergency department, 26% needed to be admitted. Interestingly, the CMI case mech in case um, uh, index is actually lower in the emergency department than it is in the uh, uh, SMA area. Uh, so we see relatively sicker patients comparably than what has been seen in the inpatient, uh, uh, in, in the emergency department, but I want to caution that these are small numbers and they're probably not statistically significant. What is, however, very significant, at least clinically very significant, is the time of uh, uh, hours spent for our patients in the different settings. So for patients that were discharged from the SMA versus patients that were discharged and treated in the emergency department, you see that the average is 20.78 hours in the ED versus only 8.4 hours in the SMA, so uh, more than double the time spent for probably a very similar type of patient situation. Um, now, for those 20 patients that were seen in the symptom management area, um, these were largely immunocompromised patients that were not mixed with emergency de uh, department, typically infectious patients, you know, so this is certainly something that um, speaks volumes for the safety of our patients. And out of those, again, 15 patients avoided an admission altogether. Um, and the length of stay, as I uh, stated earlier, in the emergency department was significantly longer than it was for patients that were treated in our symptom management area leading to significantly higher patient satisfaction. If we can move to the next. Now, since initiation of our uh, symptom management area, you see that now the trend is actually appears to be downtrending. So we see less readmissions to the acute care within seven days. We have ways to go, um, but it appears at least as it sort of is coming off the horizon right now that maybe we're actually changing a little bit um, of, of, a, of a culture here in a setting within what to do patients that present with acute toxicity that's often treatment induced. Move forward to the next slide. And so the, to summarize the observations that we've had since initiation of our symptom management area, 20 patients have been seen, 75% of those avoided admission. We had absolutely no operational deficiencies that we identified with this pilot. We had very high patient satisfaction. And really, even from a perspective of our oncology nurses, they felt that this was an acceptable workload to work with. Um, we do, however, notice that our symptom management area is severely underutilized. You know, many, many more patients would have qualified in that time frame to be seen our symptom management area that were ultimately still channeled to the emergency department. Of those 338 patients that were not seen in the SMA, um, approximately 56 admissions might have been avoided if we anticipate that uh, you know, the ones that have a less severe case, uh, case uh, index um, of less than one that, that would come back to about 56 admissions that should have not have happened if, if those patients would have been appropriately treated and seen within our you know, expert treatment area. Now, uh, what we do know for sure is that there's a lot of hours of intensive uh, interaction in the emergency department that can be avoided by having uh, such a symptom management area within the oncology unit. You see there it amounts to almost 9,000 hours of time spent in the ED that could have been avoided should, uh, were those patients seen in the SMA instead of uh, in the emergency department. And so we feel that based on our pilot results, the SMA appears to be more effective for stabilizing and discharging low acuity cases than the emergency room is. Let's move forward to the next slide, please. 
Now we do have unfortunately very significant obstacles that we have recognized. Um, the Obstacles listed here, number one, patient and physician culture to utilize the emergency department for symptoms requiring assessment by a healthcare professional is very significant. You know, this culture has been embedded and, and, and it's essentially something that we all have grown up with and have utilized for decades. And so moving out of that, you know, knee-jerk type of reflex when a patient calls with something that we feel, oh, you probably should be seen, need to see your blood pressure, need to see your creatinine, need to see if you're neutropenic, um, is typically just have, do you have somebody in the home who can get you to the emergency room, that type of knee jerk reflex needs to be broken and that is just something that will take time. Change is hard and need to remember a new program is, is, is not easy, not easy for us as physicians, not easy for us as nurses. Um, there is also a perceived difficulty in the process. We have recognized um, within our cancer committee effort, we're actually uh, using that as one of our clinical outcome goals to take a look at why our center is so underutilized. Um, and we have recognized in one of our physician surveys that there's a significant uh, perceived difficulty in the process. It's just so much easier for me to send the patient to the emergency department than to deal with, ah, oh, now I have to be on this three-way call with the charge nurse and the admitting officer, and then I have to field several phone calls from the nurses there, and that is still perceived as being more difficult for the on-call physician um, than just sending the patient to the emergency department. Um, and so we, we are, you know, investigating these type of obstacles and hoping to find solutions for them. Uh, one of them is, for instance, that we're working on patient education with each new patient that presents to our office. They all get a new patient package and we want to make sure that they have a, sort of a flyer in there that talks about the symptom management area so they are already prepared that when they were to experience one of these symptoms that the physician may in fact suggest not to come to the emergency department but rather be seen in the symptom management area. Um, and then we also want to address our existing patient population, so not just new patients, so whenever there's a change of therapy, and as you probably know with the OCM, there's a lot of um, different intersections now that require a lot of interaction and, and uh, exchange of uh, care plans, et cetera. So we want to be sure that we also include information about the symptom management area at all these intersections and, and touch points with our existing patient population. We're also in discussion with our emergency department triage system managers to see if maybe there is a way that even if a patient presents to the emergency department, department and is there identified to be appropriate for the SMA, that they might be able to bypass the ED um, registration system and potentially be uh, channeled to the SMA instead of being admitted to the ED at that uh, juncture. And then again, we're working significantly on physician education and reinforcement with our current existing attending staff who ultimately really sit at the juncture of sending the patient either to the emergency department or the SMA. And so we're working specifically with the physicians who are are known to still utilize the ED more than the SMA to sort of understand the barriers that they see and hopefully streamline uh, ways to, to get them to buy into our uh, system. Now let's move to the next slide. And so what, where we see the future direction for the SMA pilot that we have here at Lutheran is that to, to run the pilot for one year and again reevaluate the results and if it is successful, expand this particular design where feasible to the other advocate sites, which again has a big hospital system, 11 different hospitals. They're very, very heterogeneous, you know, large flagship hospitals like ours to very, very small community hospitals. And so not all of those will have an inpatient oncology unit um, option and so we're evaluating other spaces for those, like an urgent care setting, a fast track setting within the emergency department, observation units or short stay units within their hospital systems. Um, we also have advocate clinics um, that actually are partnering with the um, Walgreens minute clinics and so those are also available beyond typical office hours and we are looking to potentially partner with independent urgent care and walk-in clinics as well uh, in strategic locations where other options like ours for instance in oncology inpatient unit does not exist. And then uh, we're also working on consideration of development of treatment-specific pathways. Right now, this is more a symptom-specific pathway based on the things that we discussed, like nausea, diarrhea, fever, et cetera. And so I'm specifically interested in developing an immune-related toxicity management pathway um, as these patients are really uh, significantly different than our typical chemotherapy uh, patients. They may present with similar symptoms like nausea or diarrhea, but obviously the etiology for these symptoms is much different, and that's the treatment for these symptoms should be different as well. If we can move to the next. 
And so I brought two case studies here just to make this a little bit more plausible in terms of what this actually looks like in uh, the clinical setting. So these are two cases that are actual cases from our symptom management area within the last few months. So the first case is a 47-year-old male. He has stage 4 malignant melanoma receiving dual immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy with ipilimumab and nivolumab, has received two cycles administered to date at the time uh, when he presented to the SMA. He was managed by his primary treatment nurse since midweek, um, which was five days since his cycle number two dual immune therapy, for what he then had was just mild abdominal cramping and up to two loose stools per day. He was started on oral steroids by the nurse, prednisone, based on our pathway that we have here in the office, on Thursday, so a day after he had initially called with the complaints, uh, since they had not improved with the initial recommendation for Imodium and diet modification. But unfortunately, even with initiation of steroids, um, he uh, uh, developed worsening diarrhea on Friday afternoon, and at that point, uh, via the telephone here through our office still, prednisone was then doubled to treatment dose of one milligram per kilogram of 80 milligrams a day uh, for full uh, immune-related colitis um, uh, symptoms. Let's move to the next slide. So on Saturday morning, now once the on-call physician is now receiving this phone call from the patient after four additional liquid stools overnight, now also this uh, um, developing mild nausea, still no abdominal pain and no blood in the stools. And so with that, the young call physician decided that this patient should be assessed in the symptom management area. Um, and so when seen by the nurse there, it revealed a very stable condition. There were no signs of dehydration, no orthostasis. And the laboratory assessment was also normal, including um, the kidney function and electrolytes. A stool was produced and was sent for WBC, which ultimately resulted as positive, and C. diff was also ruled out. The patient had recently been on antibiotics, and that was negative. The patient then received IV steroids with salumedrol, a big dose, 100 milligrams, and IV fluids. He was observed for four hours, did not have any further diarrhea, felt well, and was discharged home on prednisone, 80 milligrams a day, and ultimately had complete resolution of this problem with a you know, typical uh, tapered uh, dose over the next four weeks. So let's move to the next slide. So what we uh, sort of learned as key points from this case is that this patient was again able to avoid the ER visit and possible admission. You know, for our very busy level, busy level one trauma center ER, it is not at all unusual for a patient to wait eight or even ten hours in the waiting room to be even seen by a healthcare professional. Um, so not just avoiding an ER visit, but everything that comes with the ER visit is highly meaningful for these patients. He also had an expert assessment and workup for highest likely diagnosis, again, for this particular patient, immune-related colitis, uh, rather than what most patients present to the ER with, you know, what, what an ER physician typically sees when a patient presents, especially from the oncology world, is not immune-related colitis, but more infectious colitis, and what often patients face is hours of, work, hours of workup for an infectious colitis rather than concentrating on what is the most highly likely type of situation here in this situation. Now, what worked well is that we are dealing with a well-informed patient and highly trained, experienced healthcare team up in our oncology unit with an effective and rapid intervention. The keep immune, uh, the immune-related adverse event here at grade two, which really allowed the patient to prevent escalation to a grade three, and ultimately actually allowed this patient to continue on therapy. So it was a very, very good success story, and certainly not unusual. This is this is exactly why this symptom management area exists. Now, if we want to move forward to the next slide, the second case is a 58-year-old female. She had an early-stage uh, high-risk breast cancer receiving taxotere and cytoxin. She called also over the weekend with a fever of 101.8 at home, now nine days after cycle number three. No other symptoms, feels tired, but otherwise was really quite in good shape. Uh, so this is a typical situation where typically we now would have to send this patient to the emergency room, although she sounds stable over the phone. She's in a time frame where neutropenic fever is certainly possible, and this is something that could be in a medical emergency, so this is something that needs to be assessed. Um, but many of those patients ultimately are identified not to be neutropenic, but the only way to know that on a Saturday afternoon had been for us the emergency room. And so this particular patient was appropriate 
we sent to the symptom management area, had a stat CBC that revealed a completely normal white blood cell count of 9.8. Blood cultures were drawn, a UA and reflex cultures were also sent. All these ultimately returned negative, although not available on that day, other than just the UA, which appeared benign. Also, she had an assessment of her port site by a healthcare professional with the oncology certified nurse, which uh, was looked great, clean, dry, and intact, no issues there. So it was the assumption was made that this is likely a viral infection. She was sent home with conservative measures, and follow-up was arranged for Monday with her treatment nurse for repeat CBC to be sure that she's not downward trending, and a vital sign check on her, and she recovered without any incident, in fact, did not have any further fevers. So if we can move to the next slide again. So key points here, again, another patient that was immunocompromised that was able to avoid exposure to the ER patient population. Uh, we were able to identify the absence of neutropenia very, very rapidly and avoidance of empiric antibiotics, which are typically prescribed in this type of situation. Um, and after clinical assessment and while awaiting cultures, the patient was handled uh, very uh, effectively. She was actually handled um, and, and was seen within uh, and, and sent home within 90 minutes, so an hour and a half. We knew what was going on, and she was very, very happy and um, obviously a very good outcome here. So moving forward to the next slide, um, that's really sort of summing up all the information that I wanted to sort of propose to the audience here as to how we felt um, that this, this particular symptom management area meets multiple of our requirements uh, that are upon us in terms of improving the operations of our practice within the OCM model, but also meeting some of the uh, key result areas within our hospital system, and ultimately, and probably for us most importantly, providing good patient care, you know, and as it is in the framework of Kai Clear, the Institute of Clinical Immuno-Oncology, um, my particular area of interest is immuno-oncologic um, agents, and I have a very large patient population that ultimately is seen not just in our emergency department, but in multiple different emergency departments throughout the area. We live in a very competitive northern uh, Chicagoland area where there's many, many different hospitals that compete with us that uh, and many times are closer for our patients than our own institute. And so we um, have often um, frustration uh, about how these patients are managed in, in uh, particular institutions that have less experience with these type of agents. And so although this, this particular symptom management area by no way was just designed for our immuno-oncologic treatment patients, it certainly satisfies a very significant um, need that we have for this patient population as this is still an emergent treatment um, uh, and side effects a total sort of experience that may not be as well managed in other type of practice settings. And so we really feel that uh, for even from an ICLEO perspective, this particular area uh, has a lot of value. And that's why we felt that this particular web webinar still would fit within the Institute um, of ICLEO, um, although again, this is not specific for this particular patient population. And so with this, I will conclude here and open the floor to questions that, that you guys may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Hallmeyer, for the engaging presentation. And I do have a couple of questions that came across our feed. Um, one was, uh, how were the additional resources needed for the SMA funded? So that was all based on our hospital, you know. So we, we met with the medical executive committee. We proposed this project um, and, you know, essentially did a lot of uh, data analysis in terms of, you know, the readmission, the KRAs that they had already identified for themselves, and then looking at the OCM and the outcomes uh, that, that were upon us there and putting them all together, we really felt that in a symptom management area would meet many of the hospital requirements. Advocate, as you may know, is one of the nation's leaders in terms of uh, assuming full risk for their patient population. We are our own ACO, Accountable Care Organization, and so there's a lot of things uh, where our hospital, maybe unlike uh, some other hospitals, is really ahead of the curve in understanding how these type of quality measures and how these type of projects really are making a meaningful difference for patient's care, patient's um, satisfaction, but also for cost savings. So it was, to be very honest with you, it was a relatively easy 
be pitched to make to our administration. And so the funds that were needed to renovate the, um, that particular center management area, the buy-in to you know have the nurses um, sort of stretch their time to also participate in this program, you know, to purchase the equipment that was needed, including the recliners, etc. That was really not met by any resistance. And frankly, with the the amount of money that we have saved the system by not admitting these patients, only those 20 already, um, this is probably already um, an, an investment that has resulted in the black rather than in the red. So this was not a difficult endeavor, but I have to really point out that we have a hospital administration that really gets it. And I have another question. Um, does the Primary Care Nurses Act, in addition to other duties, are they assigned per, um, per specialty? So in our we we have we have looked at that as a possibility. So our primary care nurses here, or yeah, they they really work based on workload rather than based on a disease uh, criteria, and they're also not physician associated. So we have eight physicians, and the nurses that work with us are interchangeable between all different physicians. In order to keep the workload even across our nurses, we have a rotational system. It's essentially an Excel spreadsheet, and so if I have a new patient that I see today who will be assigned to some sort of treatment and who needs a treatment nurse, it's essentially the next person on the list that will be assigned to that nurse. So this is not treatment specific, not disease specific, and not physician specific, which also means that all our patients, all our nurses remain, you know, highly qualified for everything that they do because they have a very broad exposure. The only exception to that is our anticoagulation program that is run specifically by a set of three nurses and then our transplant program, which is, which is run by a single nurse. So those are subspecialty but everything else is essentially, you know, for first come, first take. Great. And another question, how are patient systems managed during clinical hours? So typically a patient would call in, um, let's just say I feel nauseated. So they would introduce themselves with the front desk. We have one single phone number. We always answer our phone. So there's, uh, there's, we have uh, two different offices. We have about seven people answering the phones. So there is no leaving a message or anything like that. So they will be essentially triaged through the front desk. If they're identified to be a patient who's currently active in treatment, we do know they must have a treatment nurse. So we look them up in the system and as soon as the, that treatment nurse is identified, the phone call is being put through that uh, particular nurse's phone and either the patient is able to reach the nurse directly if she's available and if it's an emergency the front desk will in fact notify the nurse that this is something that needs to be addressed immediately or if it's something that can be addressed by leaving a message typically our nurses check their phones you know once an hour and then the nurse will call that patient back and identify through that triage phone call is this somebody that needs to come in today for instance for IV fluids or for an assessment of a CBC or whatever the situation might be and that essentially happens without any physician interaction. A nurse will make that decision on her own um, about a patient that needs needs further assistance, um, either over the phone or needs to be seen here. Once the patient is here and the patient is identified to be unstable where additional orders are necessary, for instance, I need to get a CBC, I need to get IV fluids, et cetera, that is then when the physician gets paged or you know they just come over to the physician area and say, hey, I have your patient here, this is what's going on. And uh, we have um, you know obviously availability where the physician might be able to just see them right here as they're here, or a covering physician who see, is, is in that office might be able to see them, or it might just be able to be handled over the phone. So it's very similar to what we would do in the symptom management area, just that it happens in our office. Great. And then our last question. Um, you mentioned that you identified a greater than 8,900 8, hours of ED um, time saved. Have you determined how much more outpatient unit hours and safe, um, staffing work required to offset this? Yeah, it would be significant. So if, if we were to be, if, if we in fact had seen these over 300 patients in the symptom management area, we would have probably been overwhelmed. That, that, that symptom management area does not have capacity at this time to handle that kind of, kind of volume. Um, so if, 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 if theoretically, if we were to have channeled those patients into the symptom management areas, we would have probably had backlogs similar to what the ER has, you know, with waiting hours, you know, because we only have three chairs, et cetera. So this program is, is slated to grow as hopefully our influx into the unit is growing as well. And it is a shifting of resources, but it's certainly a much better use of resources because any hour that is spent in the SMA is utilizing staff that's already up on the eight-hour unit. So it's not utilizing any, if you will, free units 
use of resources like it would be in the emergency department. So even though the hours that are spent are essentially equivalent, you know, if you if you think about it in terms of the service that's being provided, um, it, the way we are billing it as an observation um, and as an outpatient visit um, is is a lot more cost effective. And that's how we believe that even when once we reach the higher volume type of patient uh, throughput, that we will still be uh, significantly saving money. Um, and again, you know, I do believe that the, the patients that are seen by an oncology certified nurse, um, with the direct interaction of the attending physician on the phone, knowing the patient, knowing what their most likely problem and situation might be, will probably be saving resources as, as well on the many things that are happening in the emergency department. You know, as we always joke, you know, that the ticket into the ER is typically a, a head CT. You know, so there's a lot of things that are happening in the emergency department because they deal with things on a completely different level than we do in the oncology unit. And so many tests that are considered really unnecessary have to happen in the emergency department because of their focus being much different than our focus. And so we do believe that there's a ton of cost saving in this particular model. Well, great. Thank you again, Dr. Hallmeyer, for the engaging presentation. And thank you to the audience for participating. The webinar and slides will be available on the website accc-iclea.org shortly, and all the registrants will receive an email with the link. Please also register for our next web webinar installment on December 19th, where a panel of experts will present on world introduction to the Institute for Clinical Economic Review, ICER. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your week. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.